Welcome back to Who Wears Your Pants. <laughs> I'm here today. I, how do you pronounce your last name? Oh my goodness. Heilbrunn. So it's like Hi Il Brunn. Hi Il Brunn. You nailed it. You're basically German. Oh, I, I was born in Germany. So oh, there see? We go. Of Heilbrunn. Course. Okay, sitting here today with Jake Heilbrunn. Nailed it. He is a. I'm excited for the introduction. He is a best selling author, an international TEDx speaker, a phenomenal salsa dancer, a curious human being, a podcast host, um, a lot of other things. Especially, <laughs> especially the extraordinary salsa dancer. But yes. I would not like any video to back that statement up. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> no, you're getting great. I'm working on it. Last week's was, was rough. I'm just going to. Put that the bachata. I was just frustrated. I was oh. like, we're mo- moving too fast. I was in my head and, you know, in salsa and bachata is the man. You got a lead. And yeah, I was just like angry. And I was like angry at Michael and Rosie. I'm like, can you guys like slow the fuck down? Am I allowed to cuss on this? Thing? Oh, go okay. for it. I should have probably checked before. Nah. But um, yeah, I was like, all my stuff's coming up. Like, oh, you're upset because you're not getting this right now. And I was mm-hmm. like, then I was like, it's all good. Um, so yeah. Anyways, overall, I'm loving it. But. <laughs> and we take, we've started taking salsa classes together with a group of our friends. I'm like, every Thursday night in my house, you can come stalk us. Yeah. And <laughs> we're getting pretty good at it, though. We're basically pros now, minus well, me screwing up last week. Other than so that, yeah. golden. We all have our down days. Yes. But you stayed. You I stayed stuck through with it. it. That's I powered through to the end. What makes people great. Mm-hmm. Amen to that. <laughs> Um, I feel like I had so many things because I was, as I was saying on the way over here, researching you mm-hmm. all day long, which is weird to do to someone that you're friends with Especially and like hang friends. out with. Yeah. But I have that too. Cause I have my own podcast and research people. You like dive into the world, like the day you research them or the day before you podcast. With yeah. Them. Even though I like see you all the time. Uh-huh. I'm like, but oh. there's different layers to the onion of Jake. Oh, uh huh. so like you got to discover some of them. I'm guessing I did. Yeah. yeah. Um, definitely. And it's interesting because I think I've known you for like a year and a lot of the stuff that I was researching was probably from like four or five years ago that I don't, mm-hmm. I haven't even asked you about. Yeah. And I feel like an asshole because I, I ordered your book today. Oh, no way. Yeah. But I was I ha- about to call was- you an asshole cause you didn't ask me about my life five years ago, but ordering <laughs> the book like cancels that out. Yeah. So you're an angel still. Yes. Um, but yeah. And, and I realized that I hadn't read that yet. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, now I'm going to read your book. Wow. You're going to know the intimate parts of 18-year-old me. Yeah. yeah. So you wrote that when you were 18? Yes. I wrote 106,000 words, or 18, and I like just turned 19. So like 18, 19. Okay. Um, I wrote the first draft. I was like a man on fire. I wrote 106,000 words in three months. Whoa. Yeah. That's I was on a, a mission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Did you do anything else when you were doing that? So... Basically, when I got home and like from my journey and I realized I was writing the book, it was like coming out of like, I've never felt a deeper sense of purpose or drive for anything in my entire mm-hmm. life. And I can like, I'm a pretty driven person, Yeah. Uh, but this was like on another level. So I came home, I was living on my mom's couch and I got a job at a Mexican restaurant and literally for the next year and I got it and then I ended up getting a job at a, a nicer restaurant because um, it details matter like that obviously uh and i just worked on my book every day from like 6 a.m to like 3 p.m and like the book to like understanding like marketing business like i went down the whole personal development like obsession and then i would go work in a restaurant from like 4 to 11 Uh that was my life for like a year and a half i had zero social life it's it was amazing but like the the loneliness part sucked Mm -hmm. which like now having context of like having a great community Um, it's interesting to look back and like realize how lonely I was in certain ways, but at the same time I was so fueled and purpose driven by what I was doing. So it like filled up in that way. Yeah. I find myself because I'm slowly writing a book and I, I I work on it for like one to two hours a day, which I want to do more, but it's like, I have that feeling of like, I want to just leave and do just this, but then Mm -hmm. you know that you're going to miss the other stuff. Yeah. And you know, everyone has different ways to go about it. I think I was in a place where I was obsessed and I was so willing and open to sacrifice it. And I was also mm-hmm. like, I'm living on my mom's couch. This is great. I'm, she's not making me pay rent. Shout out to my mom and my dad. I also spent some time <laughs> at my dad. So shout out to you, dad. And yeah, I just was like, I'm going to take advantage of this. I have zero responsibility and I'm, mm-hmm. I put all of my money into the book 
in the business side of it, which, you know, cause like, as you know, too, when you're writing a book, I couldn't really write for more than like three hours. Mm-hmm. So I'd have like, which for me maxed out about around a thousand words because then that part of my brain was like fry. But then I would shift into like other parts of the process where like weren't using that creative muscle, which for me was finite. Yeah. So to backtrack really quickly as I'm thinking about this. So you dropped out of college, went to. Yes. I'll give everyone the, the, okay. the story. Because I'll, yeah, I'll just mess it up. People like to it. say it's a young dude version of eat, pray, love meets into the wild, but with a happy okay. ending. Because... I was thinking like Walter Mitty. Oh, I dig that. You know that scene in Walter Mitty when he's like skateboarding down that hill yes. in Iceland? Ah, that's like a life goal of mine. Yes. Anyways. We should all take a trip and go. <laughs> we'll do salsa dancing and skateboarding in Iceland and writing for all the writers yeah. out there. Yeah. Basically, start. I grew up in San Diego. I went to Torrey Pines High School, which is like not too far from here. And really, just like the path was paved out for me. Like you go to college, you get a degree, you work hard, you get a corporate job, like you get the family, like the whole thing, right? I grew up, my dad came home from school when I was 11 years old, didn't get out of bed for three months. He basically was working a job he hated to provide for our family and he did well. But like after doing this for years and he had other stuff going on, he just like hit a massive wall and experienced like a major depressive episode. Mm -hmm. And so I witnessed my dad not working from like 11 onwards and then my parents split up. And so subconsciously, and I think now it's conscious, but like back then, I don't think I had the word to explain this. I knew that that path did not prescribe shit in terms of like happiness. Oh yeah. Cause I had my dad who I like loved and you know, anyone who has a family member, like seeing them in pain, it sucks. And it like really affects you. And so I wanted to take a gap year in Salamanca, Spain. I was like close to doing it, but like I didn't cause it was expensive and I, no one I knew like did this. Right. So then I got into Ohio state, um, may or may not have had a fun experience visiting there partying <laughs> and like hooking <laughs> yeah. up with a girl. And I'm like, I'm going here because my sex life was clearly zero in high school. Like, so I'm like, this is great science for me. Um, and I was big into partying and like, I mean, I justified like it was a good business school. I got, um, a huge scholarship because of my ACT score, which mm-hmm. they like helped out out of state students. So like all these things, but like deep down I didn't, I knew and I was starting to feel stress my senior year in high school, even uh, manifesting in like some stomach issues like GI oh, yeah. and um, skin issues, which again, I didn't know the mind body connection That's back pretty, then. Yeah. This is where it all starts. So then I get to school three days after arriving, I start breaking out in hives and rashes like all over my body, literally and physically did not feel comfortable in my own skin. Felt like my skin was on fire. Like I would fucking waddle around because the hives on my inner thighs touching my pants would sting. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Like, I cannot go to class naked. Yeah. So. And that might have not helped my anxiety either. Yeah. You know, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe where I'm at in my life now, that would be more of a, uh, I would probably be more stoked on that. Yeah. But yeah, I was extremely anxious and I didn't know anyone who like talked about their mental health. Like when I was 17, like no one's talking about their stuff. Instagram's kind of new at this point. And so like you're flexing like the best parts of your life. Mm-hmm. I'm away from all my family and friends. I didn't know like one, I knew like one person at Ohio state who was a year older than me. He's the guy I visited. And so I start basically having this really like rough, um, like the roughest period of my life up until that point, which the beauty is I get into like this existential crisis where I'm like questioning everything in my life. Like, why am I here? I'm spending all this money in school, like for what, to guarantee what? Like, I don't even know what I wanna do. And I was like asking people, what do you wanna do? And they're like, oh, it's like a nice, safe, secure job. And I'm like, but that doesn't guarantee you, but I understand, it's like, you know, all the things. Long story short, I saw this career counselor. It started out as career counseling. It kind of like turned into therapy. Yeah. And she basically helped me realize that A, it was okay to like feel what I'm feeling and B, I had this deeper desire to travel. And so long story short, like I start developing I saw her a few times. I canceled, here's something that most people don't know. I planned on traveling for the second semester. So I canceled all my classes and housing a few days before the second semester, got so scared, I uncanceled everything. Ah. And I was like, oh, I can't do this. Like, this is too risky. Cause I'm like, oh, are you gonna leave school and like travel? Like who the fuck does that? Like I was, and again, where I come from in my background and people Mm -hmm. I knew, like no one did did that type of thing. My parents both went to Ivy League schools and sisters like an honor student and like the whole thing. My parents are super supportive. It was a lot of self-imposed pressure. I should Mm -hmm. probably uh, note that. 
Anyways, I go back for the second semester. They win the national championship football uh, game, mm-hmm. Ohio State. And it basically took me being in an environment where everyone was so happy to be there and me feeling so like, what is wrong with me? Like yeah. everyone is so happy about this and I feel like a fish out of water. And so then I had a uh, conversation with a career counselor. I was like, I've never had a panic attack, never experienced one. This was probably the closest I would ever was. Like I didn't, uh, I was like a Dean's List student the first semester. And like, I say this almost in a way like that's not good. Like I was, I never missed like an 8 a.m. class. Mm-hmm. Like why? Like that's part of college. Like and so many people would miss lectures and I was just so scared. I was always, mm-hmm. everything was being driven from a place of fear. Yeah. And yeah, she just basically asked me two questions that day that changed the trajectory of my life. The first thing she said is like, okay, if you do leave school and travel, what's the worst thing that could happen? So I like think about it and I like see myself as this failure, like living on the street for the rest of my life and like being homeless. And then I like said it aloud to her and she's like, and then I was like laughing, like just like this. I'm like, oh, when you get your fear out loud, it like doesn't sound. And you're Mm -hmm. like, oh, that probably wouldn't happen. Like realistically, that wouldn't happen. And then she's like, okay, you thought about like the worst thing that could happen. What's the best thing that could happen? Just like in that moment, I like visualized it. I saw myself traveling, having this experience and maybe writing a book. And I just like looked her in the eyes. I was like, okay, I'm doing that. Yeah. And that was the moment that like really my life changed. And I felt like this leash got like ripped off my <gasps> neck. Yeah. So from that point forward, you were like, peace, Ohio State. Yep. Let's I go. got all my money back for the second semester because it was like the first week. Hopped on a flight home had a few conversations with like the few friends I had made, which was like interesting because they're like, you're leaving me, like that whole thing. Mm -hmm. But they were like really supportive. And then uh, I worked for two months. I had a little bit of money saved up, came home. And I found this dude on the internet who had a volunteer project in Guatemala, how all trade adventures start. Mm -hmm. And it said, whatever your skill set may be, the people of Patan need your help. Wow. Uh, And so I used up a site called Workaway. It's amazing. And you basically, it's like a dating profile. Like you set up a profile, but you match with hosts around the world with a variety of different volunteer projects. Oh, wow. I've referred it to so many people because there's always this misconception that travel is expensive and all these things. Yeah. Granted, I roughed it like super, like I had bugs crawling on me every night. Like the far, the opposite end of the Ritz Carlton would be this experience. (laughs) But that's like what I wanted. I wanted like a true cultural experience. I needed something that was so different from my current reality. I didn't bring my phone because I was like, I need to get away from social media. I was going to say, and you didn't, you had no cell phone, like. Nope. I brought a Kindle tablet so I could like connect to Wi-Fi and like check my email. But I knew I needed to get away from social media because it was like affecting my mental health really bad. Mm -hmm. And I was just comparing myself to people. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, that can be like either a place of inspiration or a trap. Exactly. And where I was, it was a trap. So I. I'm looking back, I'm like really proud of myself to, for doing that. Yeah, especially, I mean, you're pretty young then. Yeah, and this was right, like this was 2014, 2015. So now like there's the social dilemma and all these mm-hmm. documentaries and research, but this was still like brand new. So I don't think people, it wasn't as much of a vocal conversation of yeah. these tools and social media are like really affecting your brain and your mental health. It's like how pregnant women used to smoke cigarettes. Really? Yeah, I, they then they didn't know it was bad for you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's like, it's all the rage until it's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So what do you think gave you the courage to do that? Because I think a lot of people have those thoughts and then never do anything about it. They're like, oh yeah, that would be really cool, but I'm just going to keep working for Bank of America. Yeah. It's a great question. And I think it's important for me to remember how fucking scared I was. Yeah. Like to this day, that was the hardest decision I've ever made in my entire life. And it's so easy because it was six years ago or something that like I can gloss over it. So first I would acknowledge like it was fucking terrifying. I think the pros and cons list and Tim Ferriss has talked about this too in terms of like decision making really like write down what is the worst thing that could happen and what is the best thing that could happen for both. There's a power to actually understanding the worst case and like you will probably laugh too. Like oh, yeah. for a, a lot of people too, they call it golden handcuffs, right? Uh-huh. Where it's like, you're comfortable, but you're not fulfilled. There's something else you want to do. I think the important thing I knew, I could always go back to school. Yeah. It's not like I couldn't go back. I could, oh, and I, I personally, I was like, I'm not going to college. Like I knew that even though I took a leave of absence, mm-hmm. I knew I was never going to come back. I kind of just did that to make my parents like not freak out. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's like mitigating the risk. 
like are looking at like, okay, what is the realistic? And then really, if the best case is truly like what excites you and like you should feel fucking butterflies in your stomach if you're feeling that, mm. that is the sign. Like that is the yes. Yeah. And visualize like feeling it in your, I would lay in bed at night and like imagine myself traveling like for like months. I knew it was like what my soul wanted. Yeah. I think there's these subtle signs that we all experience, but we don't know that's like, intuition or like the part of us that wants to do it because we're so used to dumbing it out oh what's Gary Vaynerchuk gonna think or like what's my mom gonna think or what's society <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean yeah, yeah and yeah. so I, I'm a big fan of journaling and then also I mean I didn't do this at the time but I've done this since is I'm um, getting away from social media like mm -hmm. honestly it really helps because think about how many thoughts we think a day and social media is like stimulating and providing context for the thought so if you mm -hmm. cut off the all these external sources, yeah. you can kind of sit with what you actually want. And sometimes it takes a few days for your own like innate wisdom and intelligence to come through. Yeah, to like silence everything and then reconnect with what you think. Gotta silence the haters. Yeah. <laughs> that actually, when I was in college, I changed my major and I knew I had, I didn't know what it was at the time, but I had this like weird feeling. I was like, and it wasn't like a verbal thing. It was like, this isn't what I should be doing, but I did it anyway. Mm -hmm. Cause it was like, a really like engineering it's like a really safe career field to choose it's like fairly lucrative and blah like all of yes. those like check mark things that like look really good on paper but i was like ah, there's something not right about this but mm -hmm. i didn't know what it was so i was like well i don't know what else to do so here we go yes and that what you just said that like feeling that something isn't right mm -hmm. is everyone experiences that and i think the only way to learn how to listen to the part of you that is saying yes is by you have to take the chance. Like, you, you know, you have to take that first step not knowing where the second or third is. Yeah. But, like, listen to that part of you that's saying no, even if the logical part says yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you had anxiety back then. Yeah, and, pe like, I, I, I... I, like, don't think... When I think of you, I don't think of, like, an anxious person. Yeah. Unless, I mean, I know some people have anxiety and it is, like, presents itself in different ways or they like cover it up really well but do you yeah. still have that no or? i have no. zero anxiety and when i say like i experience anxiety as like a normal human being where like oh if i'm like going on a date or i have a business meeting or like something doesn't go like mm -hmm. i experience anxiety but i don't have any generalized anxiety like i used to yeah. like back then it was like a eight month period of like severe anxiety mm -hmm. like i felt like a ticking time bomb that was about to go off yeah. And still, I don't even think then people knew it. It's so easy to hide. Mm -hmm. um, but my skin was like, uh, for me, my skin can be a telltale uh, of my mental health, which is really a blessing and a curse. No, but yeah. And it's interesting because I think I'm like, every time I've ever gotten injured or hurt or sick, like in my life, it's usually because something I need to change something mm -hmm. like when I was working at my old job I was I had really bad heartburn and I like don't I shouldn't have heartburn you know and I didn't know why and then I find out that it's because when you're under a massive amounts of stress your body creates more cortisol which like makes you more acidic yeah it, it down regulates your immune system and then yeah and then I was like having all these weird physical things happen to me mm -hmm. or like that's just one example but I feel like that happens all the time a hundred percent and i had zero idea like the mind body connection and even i've been healing they say that's like lyme disease i don't even think that's what it fucking is but that's like the name mm -hmm. it's such a complex condition now i look back i'm like oh yep again i wasn't listening to my body different oh, yeah. phase of life different circumstance different challenges but yeah i think our body is always communicating to us and it's hard to listen because you have to get really for me i have to get like really quiet yeah. And like there's periods where I like being quiet, but it's also, I get in these cycles like where it's easy to distract myself and I can go on Instagram or like swipe right or just like do anything to like sit with myself, yeah. which is where the, the real juice is. And like when I actually do slow down, it feels really good. I'm like, oh yeah. Hi That's self. Like, how are you doing, buddy? <laughs> hey you know? homie. I find that if I am avoiding that, if I like want to go, 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 it's because I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm the exact same way. And I'm that's like, the thing wanna... that I know I need to do, which is like the <laughs> worst part about it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't have anxiety anymore. You brought up Lyme disease, but we haven't told all of the listeners. Yeah, we can explain that. that. But I think the one thing which is cool, because my TED Talk is called How to Replace Anxiety with Purpose, yeah. which is wild, by the way. It had like 
not even 10,000 views for like two years. And now it's like almost at a hundred thousand views. Yeah. So I'll get DMS from people who watch it and they're like asking oh, me about wow. how to help them with anxiety. And it, it's so, and I like tell them, I'm like, wow. Like if you had any idea how severe my anxiety was and I have like, feel like I have zero anxiety right now. Yeah. Like there's so much hope. And again, there's a lot of different factors for people. Sometimes it, like I think hormones and like body, if your body's off, like it, like my experience with Lyme disease in the beginning, I had like, I would have extreme like dips where I would start crying. It wasn't so much anxiety, but it was just like, I felt like my emotions were like beyond my control. And I've done a lot of PMS. Yeah. Well, uh, (laughs) I grew up with two sisters and my mom. So like I should have known them, but yeah, it gives me way more empathy for women because you guys go through this like every month. And you're like, why am I crying? (laughs) Yeah. Straight up. I would, well, I mean, granted, I woke up in like extreme amounts of pain with the Lyme, especially in the beginning, but it was, it was wild to feel out of control. I've like, I was like, buckle up. The wave is here and there is nothing I can do to escape it. I just have to ride. And that was the hardest, (laughs) like, you know, the college Ohio state anxiety, that was really rough. And I think, you know, life presents us with the challenges that we're, we can face like Mm -hmm. at that time. So dealt with that cool but then yeah Lyme disease was a whole thing. whole nother bucket of worms I'm like before we dive into some of that stuff you what you said about your TED talk is really interesting because I think so you give this TED talk and you get some people watch it views and things like that and then years go by and then all of a sudden mm-hmm. like 80,000 people watch it yep. which is and I think that that's something that a lot of us forget and it happens a lot, you mm-hmm. know, like you can't expect things instantly to happen. Or, you know, if you're constantly planting seeds all over the world, trees will grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's funny. It's funny to bring that up because I put out so much content in my life. Like I used to blog every week for a year and a half. So I, oh, wow. and like, we didn't, where's I'm, your blog? Um, it was on a site called eyes fully open. I switched it to jakehopron.com. But then like, because I switched from like WordPress to Squarespace, all of my blogs got deleted. Some of them exist on medium and my LinkedIn. Cause mm-hmm. I would like cross post them there. But I used to put out so much, like I, if you look at like my old YouTube arc archives, like or archives, I like leave the videos there because I love witnessing my journey. It's embarrassing. So I'm oh just no, like, I anyone? love that. Did you watch them? Oh, oh no, oh, you haven't seen no, them. I haven't. But I love oh, watching I'm people's like, like first video that's ever been done. Like I look at people that have like have now like five hundred thousand followers, and I look at the very first video they ever made, and I'm like, this mm-hmm. is a great exercise to be like, look at where they went from yes, where they started. A thousand percent, and yeah. that's what I love. And even just personally, I love like looking where I started and be like, oh my god, it like makes me cringe, but I'm like. Yeah. Keep going, buddy. Um, but I put out so much content and I've, you know, I've read a lot of Ryan Holiday and like how to market because a huge mm-hmm. part for me, it always depends on the intention, right? With your book or whatever. But yeah. like I was doing speaking gigs, uh, the TED talk, I did a Kickstarter, like really wanted the book to get. And so I'm trying to learn how to like market and like, because as a creative, like for me, part, like a huge, most of the fulfillment comes from just the, the art itself, mm-hmm. but sharing it, it doesn't feel complete unless someone's eyes or ears see it if that's how I feel Um, so I I always found that important and at some point you have to like let go and let God and not be attached to it mm -hmm. so I practiced my face off for that TED talk like I practiced religiously like I probably have videos on my computer be practicing like (laughs) pacing in my room like pretending I was there like looking like a total coop but like that's really like what I did I practiced at high schools I gave the talk at like three different high schools like really practiced and now I'm like so proud of it because I knew a it's evergreen it's gonna live online forever Mm -hmm. and I'm like I don't have control over this thing like yes I, I spent like um my TED talk also took a year for them to publish it which was like a whole other thing Oh wow! but yeah, I spent like a month and I like emailed a bunch of people. I'm like, hey, I think you'd, but then I was like, I'm, I'm over it. And yeah, mm-hmm. now it's picking up. But I think it's always be proud of the work you create. And then mm-hmm. if it does pick up, like amazing. But yeah. I was so proud of it. I didn't care. Like there was a part of me like I just, I did everything I could and I can like go to bed knowing I gave it my all. Mm-hmm. And now it has a little bit more views and it's reaching people, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think a lot of the time it's like what, is motivating you is so important. Like if you're motivated by just expressing yourself or if you're motivated by making an impact or whatever have you. Totally. Um, And like knowing what that is when you create something like that. A thousand percent. And I think that mixture of like intrinsic motivation with like a purpose is like the most powerful, you Mm. know, potion for creating something that can have the legs to reach people. Yeah. That's really awesome. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
Okay, so now the <laughs> like the the Lyme disease. Yeah, there's so many directions we can go. I so know. whatever you want to just interrupt, like, we can go. What I, I think I wrote. <clears throat> I think I put a question in here. I'm like, what? But yeah, so. Oh yeah, because I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> um, because like, you've had this for a while. At yeah, this point. October 17, 2019, and I can give like. Here's the thing, like, yes, it's quote unquote, Lyme disease is what they call it. Mm -hmm. It's a much more complex condition. And I believe, I subscribe to the belief that like I create my reality. Mm -hmm. I believe that the whole Lyme thing manifested over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Oh, actually going back to anxiety, this is really interesting. I had panic attacks. I said I never had a panic attack in my adult life. I didn't realize this was a panic attack. So when I was like six, seven, eight years old in soccer games, I would get panic attacks. I can't believe I like, forgot. I said it like, oh, I've never had a panic attack. Yeah. I, I, became, I came to this realization in the last six months of like, that's what I experienced when I was little. Mm -hmm. My parents thought I had asthma. My like throat would close oh. on playing soccer. I was so scared to fuck up. Yeah. I told you I played competitive soccer. Yeah, in the yeah. way. And these, I played for these crazy British soccer coaches who just yell at you. And I hated being yelled at. Oh. I was the only player on the team they didn't yell at because they realized like if you yell at Jake, he's not going to play good. He's going to have a panic attack. He's going to have a panic attack. Why I'm sharing this, and I had issues uh, when I was in like third, fourth grade with like, I always thought my parents were going to die. I like went through this weird period oh. um, and my parents were having marital problems. Like that's what they tell. Like I don't fucking know. I'm not yeah, a yeah. third grade. Like, oh, mom, dad, your marital problems are like, causing X in my body. Like, what yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? yeah. <laughs> but um, I share that because... I believe like we all have these certain patterns. You could call them traumas and it doesn't mean like it has to be a capital T trauma of like a violence or like sexual assault, but like things that happen that we start acting a certain way in the world in order to feel safe and protect ourselves. Totally. And like most of this is subconscious. So yeah. I still am like becoming aware of it and my ayahuasca journey helped me kind of uncover some of this, mm -hmm. um, which is like we can bookmark that for later. <laughs> yes. uh, we're all over the place here. Why I'm bringing this all up is like I had the anxiety experience in college. Mm -hmm. Clearly, like there's always been a part of me that's been driven. And I think there's um, I don't think drive is just good or bad. I think it can be a combination. I think mm -hmm. drive can be altruistic and drive can be coming from fear. And like neither is good or bad. That's just the reality that I can speak to in my own life. So I went through that whole experience. Then I ended up meeting my business partner. Um, he was my mentor at first. Long story short is we started working together. We basically built this online course teaching people how to give a TEDx talk because he'd given four and I'd given a few and like done tons of speaking. Mm -hmm. I love creating content. He loved doing sales. It was just like a, it worked. Mm -hmm. Very quickly, like we, I mean, we were basically like husband and husband yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. from a work standpoint. You were work husbands. We work husbands. Yeah. And like we both love to surf and like I, he was like, I looked up to him as a role model. So before we started working, I'm like, this guy's so cool. Like, he surfs and like he had an impact travel company. He raised like millions of dollars for charitable projects around the world. Like I really looked wow. up to him and all these, he was like just the man. And so we start working together and then very quickly, like we went from in January of 2000, I think it was 20. Yeah. January of 2018 or 20 January, 2018, we made $6,000 February we made 70 grand and in March we did a hundred grand oh my and gosh. it's just like basically two of us. Yeah. And so, and from there, the company grew in that year to like eight people. And then 2019, it really grew. Mm -hmm. Why I'm bringing this up is I felt I dropped out of school. My grandfather on my dad's side, like escaped from the Holocaust, mm -hmm. came here. My mom's father, like. You have such a German last name. Heilbrunn. Heilbrunn. That's totally not German, <laughs> my <laughs> accent. But like uh, people, in, I always meet Germans and they say it 10 times better than me. Okay. I'm like, ah, oh, I'll get there one day. But uh, my mom's dad, like. Base, like they basically sacrificed everything and like in their minds like education is so important it's like mm -hmm. the pathway to success and like some ways saving your life like my dad felt a lot of pressure from his father to go to medical school and then he ended up crashing and burning because that wasn't true to himself yeah. but like his dad was just like do that because i don't want you to fucking die and if you're a doctor the nazis could save you like you know <laughs> so there's all these like beliefs so i always felt this pressure like i can't fuck up but i also have to prove myself so after dropping out and it's, it's none of their fault. I'm just kind of giving context. Of, oh, like how did I develop this belief? Maybe that was part of it. 
I felt like all this pressure that because I dropped out of school, I had to like be something. Mm -hmm. Like I can't drop out. It's like you're either a dropout and you're Steve Jobs or you're a fucking failure and there's no in between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And so this is all this self imposed stuff. I put all my like self worth into what I did as a career. Like I thought that was like everything. Yeah. And so this, you know, we're, we build a, we did like a million dollars our first year in revenue, which is bananas considering I'm like 20 years, 21 years old. Like don't yeah. know what the fuck I'm doing. Uh, I'm sure you knew what you're doing. I, yeah, 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 I did, but I also didn't. Yeah. Which is like the, the funniest part about this whole adventure. I think that that's how, that is like how you actually make moves is like if you do things before you're ready. Like yes. I thousand percent yeah. agree. And, and granted Taylor was, he was my man, like he was big on that he would set these audacious goals and there's like pros and cons to this. Uh, and I'd be like, what the fuck? And he would just look at me and be like, you're going to figure it out. And I'm like, Ugh! and then I would, <laughs> yeah. and, but it would cause me extreme anxiety, oh, you know, pros yeah, and cons yeah, yeah. to this. So then in relationship with him, I've, I've, I feel like I've had a thing with like male authority figures. It's been like, I've mm -hmm. learned um, that I can, it's hard for me to sometimes to speak up for what I want mm -hmm. and like voice my needs. And so in the relationship with Taylor, it was just growing fast. And I was like, oh, like I started this company. Like people would like, you know, hit me up. You're like, oh, it's so cool what you're doing. Like you've taken the road less traveled. Like you're balling out. We're like traveling the world, building a business in Costa Rica, like having touring Europe on the speaking tour, like having these epic experiences. And most of business is so not sexy, you know, oh, yeah. like people. And, and like, I always remind this too. It's like, oh, that person looks like they're crushing it. They're fucking on sales calls like 80% of the time, or they're doing like back end work on entreport, like a CR, like it's so like not sexy, you know? Yeah. But I, there was, my ego was so involved in it. And I think over time, oh, this is really interesting. <laughs> so I go to Thailand, this is February of 2019 with my friends and I'm work, I'm taking two weeks off and like I hadn't taken a, a full proper break. I am like stressing out of my mind to take two weeks off because A, I didn't know how to like um, delegate very well. Mm -hmm. And I the company was so reliant on me from a marketing perspective that like to take two weeks off, I had to like pre-set up everything and like train people like if this goes wrong. I was so scared and stressed to take two weeks off. I got strep throat like three times in the six week period. I um, got a virus too. And then, so I get strep throat for the second time a night or like three nights before I'm leaving on this trip to Thailand, go to Thailand and I'm starting to have like, so I'm, I've had strep throat twice now. The last few weeks have been weird. I go to Thailand and my friends are like joking with me. They're like, dude, you're like a grandpa. Like I was just tired yeah. and I like, I just felt off, which is really interesting. And then I come home, we had like a 36 hour travel day. I get strep throat when I come home. And I'm feeling all this stress and like guilt of like, I took time off. I'm, how am I allowed to be 22 years old, making all this money, traveling to Thailand? Like I had all this guilt that was self-sabotaging oh, a thousand percent. I yeah. didn't think I was worthy or deserving of every, anything. And so I think the way that I subconsciously was like, Hey, we're going to get you sick. Cause like that will make you, you know, we're kind of going into some realms, no, but this yeah, is yeah. like, this, I really think played into it. I got real, like all this health issues. And then I saw doctors got all this blood work. Everything seemed fine, but that happened in like, f um, February, March. Oh no, th this was like, um, sorry, I booked the trip in February. This was May and June mm -hmm. of 2019. Why this is important is cause like those two months, there were warning signs. These were red flags looking back that I didn't know how to listen to mm -hmm. the next three months. I feel the healthiest from a physical perspective I've ever felt. Like I got out of that funk. I did a peyote ceremony and I like asked, I was like, please show me how this is manifesting, whatever. And I think it did help me like slow down again, like what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. For me, plant medicine is a beautiful way to connect with myself and like really be like, what do I want? Uh, actually out of the peyote ceremony came, I was like, it's time for me to do my podcast. It had been like an idea percolating. I was like, I'm doing it. And creative expression is a huge part of who I am. Mm -hmm. Like I have to be doing it for like my own health, honestly. Yeah, yeah. But like the business was growing. Um, and so we're going to fast forward to October. Our business has like 30 people in it now. I don't even know the names of some of the people. Yeah. We're starting to hit big months. Taylor's trying to kind of like step out of the business. And it was like, in my opinion, way too early. Yeah. He basically was like looking at me to like run the company. I didn't have the balls to tell him or even the self-awareness be like, dude, I'm not enjoying this. I want to take a step back from the comp. I want to focus on my zone of genius, which is like content, email marketing, like yeah. writing. I would, I hated hiring people, hated like managing, like 
it was sucking the soul out of me. Mm-hmm. I also like want to like have a life yeah, and start like dating more and like having more time. Like I, I was so used to being busy. Mm-hmm. This is hindsight. I didn't know how to voice this. Yeah. And then, yeah. Uh, so I it's like building up. It's building up you. inside. And my body had warned me like literally that's why I, now I've learned like the body's always speaking to us. October 17th, 2019, I came home, I came home from the office at like 132 and all of a sudden start not feeling well mm-hmm. feel like a fever come on like overnight my life changed october 17th wow. um since that night i've not had a normal night's sleep like um extreme headache extreme fatigue i tried holding on for the next month until me and taylor who was my business partner we sat down and he was like yo you're not okay i was like this is how much my ego and like i was too scared to admit that i was fucked up yeah and I was like crying all the time. Like, I don't know how I'm gonna, and I was falling in love for the first time too with this girl. And like oh then goodness. things kind of were breaking off with her cause she was in LA. And I'm like, okay, my health is fucked. I have to step away from the business. I was so scared to step away from the business because I had all, I was like, you know, 21 to, I just turned 23 when my health started. I had experienced all these firsts and I associated Taylor in the company with all these, with my level of happiness. Mm-hmm. So I thought without him in the business, I would never be able to make money. I would never get to travel and surf and have these experiences. Yeah, like I your identity it. was so married to this company. Yes. Yeah. And oh, it was like so painful. Like well, those next five, six, seven months were so dark. Did you leave the company then or no? So it was like a slow thing. So I took no, like this was halfway. So I basically like lasted another month, like fighting. And then, and then we're like, dude, you need to take. So I took the last two weeks of November and then the whole month of December off. It's like, I just need time. Mm -hmm. I had, and granted, I have no idea. It's quote unquote Lyme disease. I'm getting all these tests and like nothing's coming back showing anything, which unfortunately like it's traditional common. medicine does not show up uh, a lot of these things mm-hmm. and then i had the worst relapse ever over like christmas new year's like the d- worst two weeks of my life um like the most extreme amount of pain like i if that would have lasted like i don't know how i could have lived to be honest it yeah. was really dark kind of came out of that but then it was like trying to slowly do like a few things back in the company like i was just so fucking like looking back i'm like this is adorable dude that you fucking <laughs> yeah. you did you there was a part of me that like hated the company hated what i associated with it even though i mm. loved taylor loved the people but mm. i was just too fucking scared to let it go and then i tried holding on i went to a joe dispenza retreat in mid-february oh. was like deep into joe dispenza for um all of january and early february because i thought that could heal me which mm. Yes, and I just expected it. I got super sick. I honestly think I might have got COVID after this. Like, I, I had influenza A, but like with everything I was experiencing, oh, I was wow. so sick. And that was when it was like, dude, I'm I can't work. This con- like I'm yeah. done. And that was really dark because a that was where it's like I had a s- officially like split from the business. Like I'm not yeah. coming back. I was like imagining myself on disability pay, like living at my dad's for the rest of my life. Oh my <laughs> or like it, you know, this is where like where my mind's going. Yeah. And yeah, I couldn't work. And for the next few months, I just like didn't work. Finally, on March 16th, um, I got the lab results back that Lyme and Babesia, it's another tick-borne thing, came back positive. I still like have my own perspective on those things. And I think over time, all this stress and anxiety in these patterns that have existed in me since I was a kid, Mm -hmm. like, like you said, cortisol, suppresses the immune system it opened the space for all these viruses and um, bacteria to like activate and i think it just so now i've like i have a holistic and functional approach to how i'm healing where it's like it's not you don't just get rid of lime it's like now i have to heal my adrenals and like all the things but i've made insane progress like so from october 17th to now like i'm a different person but i'm still far from normal yeah i mean i feel like even since i've met you I've no, I, and when I met you, I'm like, I've noticed a difference, but yes, that makes you yeah. feel like, yeah. <laughs> like, I feel like you even look different. Interesting. Well, it's the long hair probably. <laughs> maybe I'm like, do you look tanner? I don't know. Maybe it's that. Um, he has a wetsuit tan now. Yeah. No, but yeah, maybe it, maybe like, I, I appreciate that feedback. Yeah. I think it's like in your eyes mm. or like around your eye. I don't know. No, you, I think you're actually right. I guess I don't look into my own eyes. So it's hard to see, you but do, that do, you, do you know, like when you see someone, like you can tell when the spark and vitality is in a person. And if you talk to someone who's sick, that spark is not there. Yeah. 
And I, and it was a fucking weird thing to lose that spark. Yeah. And that's exactly what it feels like to be going through a chronic health condition. Yeah. It's like, I feel like we're all, when we're at our highest potential, we're this like burning fire. I felt like I was like, someone had dumped a bunch of water on me and I was like a few sparks, like trying to reignite. That's oh what it felt God. like. It's very odd. Like I had zero sex drive. Um, just like all these parts of me were just not there, but I knew I'm like, you're there, but like you're dormant. It was such a strange, wild, such a strange time. Yeah. It's a really interesting disease. Mm -hmm. I've known a couple of people that have it or have gotten it mm -hmm. and like everyone's experience is wildly different. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is why I almost don't even think mine is quote unquote Lyme disease. Mm. Um, that's become in many ways an umbrella term for like certain chronic and certain people like fully have Lyme disease. So mm -hmm. I'm not like taking away from that experience, but in mine, I think it's just more of a complex. All systems have gone haywire from chronic stress yeah. and quote unquote Lyme is one of the things that got activated. So, okay, let me ask you this because you're such a driven person. Mm -hmm. And I know in, in your podcast episode where you talk about the ayahuasca, you talk about like the Trevor Hall song where it's like the letting go. Mm. And how do you, how have you been able to do that? Because obviously you can't do everything and you're, are so driven. And even I'm sure like, you're like, I'm going to get better. I'm going to fight through this, mm -hmm. which almost probably like could make it worse. Yeah, right. It totally does. It's a great question. The ironic part is the biggest acceleration in my healing happened from the ayahuasca experience. I don't Yes, like it was the ayahuasca, but it was it was more just the realization it gave me, mm -hmm. which was like stop trying to heal. Yeah. <laughs> which makes no logical sense. But every day for a year, my mind was consumed of logically trying to heal myself. Mm -hmm. I was seeing multiple doctors looking I've read every article on the fucking internet about Lyme disease and like chronic illness. Do what makes me feel better? is when I'm present, mm -hmm. when I'm in nature, and when I'm out of my head. So anytime I'm on Google or like thinking about it is actually like causing my body anxiety, which is suppressing my immune system. Yeah. So the ayahuasca experience, like you surrender or letting go. Have you ever heard that term? <laughs> like a million times yeah. a day. We live in Encinitas <laughs> where it's like the fucking Bible word is That's surrender, like the, right? like the slogan, Encinitas. Surrender. surrender. And I see it every day and it's like, I love seeing it, but I'm also like, what the actual fuck does that mean? You know what I mean? And mm. for me, it took <laughs> ayahuasca. It took, so I did two night back to back. The first night, as you listened to it, I didn't surrender and I was like holding on, mm -hmm. um, which basically means I was so scared to let go of all the thoughts and experience I have as Jake, which there's a quote by Thich Nhat Hanh. He says like, out of fear of the unknown people choose suffering that is familiar to them. Oh yeah. yeah. Cause we're just like creatures of habit. And so what, that's why you like get into the same relationship over and over and over again. Exactly. With like the epitome of like your mother, your father. You, you, until yeah. you make the, like Carl Jung calls it, until you make like the unconscious conscious, you'll mm -hmm. like live your life and call it fate or something to that degree. Hmm. But like, yeah, it's essentially how do we become conscious of the unconscious, which, you know, science says now that's over 90% of our waking thoughts and actions is unconscious. Uh -huh. So yeah, the second night I learned how to like let go, which for me, I, there's a brilliant book called Letting Go, The Pathway to Surrender. Yes. Have you read it? I have a weird, I'll tell you this story in seven seconds. Um, I saw that book, like a, a woman that I write note, show notes for, she's one of my clients for her podcast. She Someone recommended that book, so I remembered seeing the picture of it. Mm -hmm. And then I was at a friend's house and I saw the book on their bookshelf and I was like, hey, how, did you like this book? And he was like, I don't know, I never read it, but weird story. He's like, you can have it. And he was like, I'm probably not gonna read it. I drove over it in my car and I didn't know what it was. And I, I got out and I picked it up and it was that book. Wow. Have you read it? Yeah. I've been reading it okay, slowly. Amazing. It's, it's, it's like repetitive, but for me, it's so brilliant because I think until you understand how to let go in your body, the book or hearing these terms can piss you off because they pissed me off. <laughs> so maybe I'm projecting because <laughs> no. it's like, how do you let go? It's like, if you're going through a breakup or you're, you broke your leg and you're in a cast for six months, or you just like let someone died in your family, or you're going through a chronic illness, mm -hmm. like the mechanism for letting go is the same. And this is what I learned in the ayahuasca ceremony, which is like, essentially we have a sensation in our body of pain. 
how can I close my eyes and like become the sensation? So like if it's in my chest, like just like getting quiet, close my eyes and breath and just like sitting with that feeling. And every time I catch my, my story or my head start to make a thought about, Oh, back to, back Mm -hmm. to here. So it's like, you know, you're going to catch yourself going, Oh, like, um, is, is it, is Karen's ex-husband's neighbor's wife is that's what she did back to the feeling and just sit with that pain and it transmutes and that's what letting go is. Like my experience with it, which I experienced on tripping my face off on ayahuasca in the plant medicine ceremony, bringing that into real life and being with my pain every day really helped. Um, So it's like, instead of avoid, 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 just like sit with it for a little bit Mm -hmm. and then it will dissipate. That's the premise of the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's healed tons of different conditions from that. And so million, probably thousands of people around the world, probably millions too, but he's documented thousands of people. Wow. Yeah, and I, it, it, this is like a daily thing for me. I love to be like, oh, I'm fucking good now. No, nope. yeah. Like I would say for the two months after the ayahuasca ceremony, it really like, I was really good about it and I was making progress and I'm still making progress, but I catch myself being frustrated of like, like I have these, un, like I don't know why, but my brain's like, oh, after two years of this, like you're gonna be healthy. Mm-hmm. It's like, maybe you fucking won't, dude. And it's hard for me to grasp that, mm-hmm. but all I can do is just be present. Like I'm doing everything I can on the health front, so just like let go, let mm-hmm. God be with my pain. And ironically, that's what's going to help me. <laughs> that is, yeah, it's like a very backwards way mm-hmm. of figuring things out. Mm-hmm. And like, I think, oh yeah, in, in your podcast episode, I was listening to it. I'm like, this is what everyone should do in life and like literally everything. And we just can't seem to do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's hard. It's like a lot easier said than done for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I forget what was the Trevor Hall quote. It was, oh, well, he's, um, it's a song called You Can't Rush Your Healing. Yes. And he's like, you can't rush your t- healing. Um, darkness has its teaching. Love is never leaving. You can't rush your healing. Yeah. I think I might have missed one line in there, but that's the premise of it. Roughly. Which, same. and he's right. Like the darkness did have its teaching. And for me, it's like I get to redesign my life. Mm-hmm. You know, like I was very subscribed to that, like hustle porn, Gary Vee culture. Like you gotta, <laughs> you gotta work, you know, like, porn. well, it's, um, I think the problem with social media and like self-help advice is it's, there's not context to it. Mm-hmm. So like, do I agree that hard work and work ethic is super important? Yes. Yeah. I'm super fucking driven. No one needs to tell me to work harder. Like, like no one will ever have to tell me to work harder. Yeah. My, what I need to be told is like, check in with your body, listen to your body because you not listening to your body is what gets you sick, which mm-hmm. puts you out of work in the first place. Someone else might be lazy and they need to be get told that message. So yeah. um, I'm getting to redesign my life with terms and ways that support me in my health. And that's, I think what everything was like showing me like, hey, that way of life and coming, coming, coming from that place of like a fear pattern or like, I can't fuck up. Yeah. Will no longer work for me. So it's been a rough <laughs> time to get to this point and a rough lesson to get to this point. But to me, I look at everything, the dis ease in the body as like teaching and lessons mm-hmm. at the end of the day. I was going to ask you what, like, this has taught you, mm-hmm. but it's all of that. Yeah, that's one. It, <laughs> yeah. So in a way, it's like been the biggest blessing in my life, and like, I'm 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 grateful for it in so many ways. I'm still experience pain and like the things, so it's hard for me to be like, oh, it was the best thing that's ever happened to me. I'd love to say that like at some point, but I really can say, I feel more comfortable in who I am. Like I'm uh. so comfortable in who I am, and. I think there's something when you go through that amount of pain and darkness, you have to sit with the darkest. I've looked into the fucking crevices Ooh. of my shadow, like, you know, and there's something to be said about going to that place and experiencing the depths of pain mm-hmm. and knowing like I'm okay. And mm-hmm. again, cause if I had all this self worth tied into my career, it's like, who's going to love me? Can I be happy without all these things? And to be loved and to love myself without, a cool job title and like not making much money be like oh wait people like me for who i am like they don't give a fuck about all these things and the people that like you for those things are probably people that you shouldn't be spending your time with anyway exactly so i think that's been probably the biggest it just kind of was like revealed to me the layers that i had been wearing as a mask and not consciously but like oh 
you know, if you take that thing off, like life's pretty fucking sweet yeah. and it's lighter. <laughs> it feels better. You don't have to drag that around. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's amazing. I feel like that happens <laughs> if you go through something difficult mm -hmm. and then you come in on the other side and then all of a sudden it's like the fears that once existed are no longer there. Mm -hmm. It's like when you stare the boogeyman in the face. You're not scared of the boogeyman anymore. <laughs> Especially when the boogeyman is you. <laughs> yes. It's always a part of us. Uh, I love people too who have like gone through some stuff. You can kind of like tell when you meet someone, you're like, yeah. oh, I feel like safe around you because you've been through some shit. And it's like, I've been through some shit and we can like relate on that, you know? Yeah. Well, I, it's weird because like I've met you and like this whole group of people kind of in Encinitas that... The more that I get to know them, the more I realize like every single one of these people has gone through some like major moment in their life where they're like, I am going to change everything about mm -hmm. what I'm doing, yes. which is really interesting that like, I, I don't know if it's just because everyone does that or it's just like that we've all found each other mm -hmm. or whatever it might be. I'm not sure. That's a good question. And I think it's got to be like, we're all probably, you know, there's a reason the people are in our lives. Like, yes, there's similar interests and whatnot, but at the same time, I think and when I just look back, I'm like, oh, I always attract people kind of like in somewhat of a season or flow or like a trait that we're all kind of seeking, whether yeah. that's like community or like whatever, or like going through something personally yeah. in our lives. How did we meet? How did we meet? Uh -huh. I think. Like, like I know like the crew we met through, but I'm like, I don't. I remember because I knew Jessica and then she was like, you have to meet all of these people in this house. Like, they're really awesome. Mm -hmm. Like, I went over there one day and I was just like dancing with them. And then we went into the sauna and I was like, oh, this sounds like great people. And she was like saying how amazing like all of you guys were. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I don't, I think maybe like you guys were, you were DJing one sunset or something. And I went to your house. I, yes. Oh, that's yeah. totally what it was. Yeah. Cause I feel like I first like met, met you when we went to Idlewild. Yeah. 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 That was like, yeah. Okay, so that actually hasn't been that long. Mm -mm. We've only known each other for like five months then. So we're friends though. <laughs> well, you haven't signed my friendship agreement. So I don't know if I can uh, agree to that, especially publicly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone over that was. Yeah. Oh yeah, I didn't, even, I didn't add that into the intro. You're also a DJ. I mean, I wouldn't call myself like a DJ. I'm more like, yes, I DJ, but I'm like, I'm new to it. Sure, sure. It's like my salsa. It's like I'm definitely better at DJing than I am at salsa, but that's not saying much. Yeah, I think we could all say that we're better at other things. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, we're going for, for me. It's like, I, um, again, this is the other cool thing. Um, I wanted to fucking DJ and I was like, I'm going to DJ, which yeah. I know that sounds really obvious, but I've had many things in my life where I'm like, oh, like that's not my zone. Like I'll let musical people stay in my zone. And like in the last year, I've become so musically I was um, inclined. You, you sing and you write music and you play the guitar. And, yeah. yeah. I mean, I wouldn't go far as saying singing, but like, yes, I like I've expressed that part of me. And I think again, one of the benefits of the dark is like, man, when you're sitting in your bed and like basically bedridden and like the world's mm -hmm. going on and you're in that much pain, you're like, I have nothing to fucking lose. And when I'm better, I'm grabbing life by the yeah. horns. Yes. Yeah, like, mm -hmm. they're like, I'm going to take, especially when you've come through the darkness, mm -hmm. onto the other side. Oh, yes, the other side. Sweet. So keep going, people, <laughs> if you're there. I'm not even on the other side fully. Like, I'm many ways on the other side, but. But, yeah. Yeah, it's a good reminder because when I was in the shithole, it's like I needed to be told that every day. Yeah. Well, and it's cool that I think that there are a lot of people that it's like, oh, I want to DJ, but then they never do. Mm-hmm. Or like you're like me and you're like, oh, I want a DJ, but like I don't have DJ equipment. Maybe I should get some. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like there's also <laughs> plenty of things for me where I, I like there's different levels of like desire or motivation. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think it's just why not? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Okay. So now that you're hopefully on the upswing, mm -hmm. I feel like you've already lived a full life at such a young age, mm -hmm. what is next for you? Yeah. It's funny you ask that because I don't fucking know <laughs> and I'm okay with it. Oh my gosh. And this is amazing. coming from someone who like, I used to freak out about this yeah. stuff. I had to know, like I was so not okay with uncertainty mm -hmm. and I'm by no means perfect, but what? Yeah. I know it's shocking. <laughs> like, uh, you know, my, uh, wetsuit tan and my, my long curls, uh, <laughs> far from perfect. Um, 
Yeah. So one thing that I keep, this is something I keep reminding myself of because like in one way, I'm just so happy to be feeling better. I'm like, I like, I was like, I don't give a fuck what I, I could be a bartender the rest of my life and be happy if I have my health. Uh-huh. So on one hand, it's like, I don't care because of my health. But on the other hand, that's not true because as I'm getting my health back, I'm having other goals and dreams and desires. I gave myself permission for 2021 that this is my year of like ease and fun. Mm-hmm. So I've got a great job. I f- love my job. Mm-hmm. It's like, I don't work more than 20 hours a week. Yeah. And um, it pays my bills. I'm not like racking up and saving for my future. Yeah. But I'm like, I, I really am a big believer in seasons of life. Yeah. And so I've embraced like this season is last one. Last year was a dark year. This year is like fun. I'm about to go to like Central America and like surf. My first trip I've gone on in like two years. Going to salsa. Salsa, surf, and sun. <laughs> um, and for me, like the podcast is a passion of mine. It's something I see myself doing for the rest of my life and just like, conversations like these it's just like a flow state for me and I love like learning about other people which obviously you're the same way (laughs) so yeah for me it's just like the podcast um surfing's become a huge part of my life so like leaning into surfing and just other things that fuel my health and like Mm -hmm. make me feel energized Mm -hmm. to live and yeah I'm I'm just for me I'm I'm just paying attention to the things that call out to me like yes there's the part of me and i'm very watchful now of like that wants to like start a company it's like not now buddy like you are in rest and recovery mode but yeah i don't know i i feel drawn to like coaching in certain like i think that's more down the line for me love storytelling which i'm kind of currently doing for me as long as i can like use my gifts which for me is like storytelling content creation self-expression which I get to do in my current company via like email marketing, which like sounds super dry, but I fucking love it. No, but it's totally a thing. Mm -hmm. And it like, (laughs) it makes money. So it's like great. Yeah. So as long I'm like less attached, attached to what it looks like and more attached to like what I want to feel. And so whatever that is like universe, like hook a brother up, like we'll see how it, how it ends up. I love that idea to just go based on how things make you feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause it's ironic too. Like so many of the things that I thought would give me a feeling don't. And I'm yeah. like, what the fuck? Yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm excited for you. Yeah. Okay. I have one final question. <sighs> Unless there's anything you'd like to add. No, you've been, I mean, I feel like I've talked like this whole time. So <laughs> it hasn't been so much of a conversation, I'm like, but I've had fun. It's like going on a date where like the person's like, I've had the best time and I've talked like literally none of it. I'm like, this was awful, but I'm glad you had fun. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm hoping you had a more fun time than no, me because I, I had fun talking. I have had a lot of fun listening. Um, is okay. You ready? The last question is: Who wears your pants? I do. I was very stern. But can I ask? Am I allowed to ask another question? Oh, go for it. What yeah. is? What does that mean? Well, it's funny because this, like the the premise or the story behind it, was like you know how people ask in a relationship who wears the pants. Mm-hmm. Um, I was with my cousins and my family and I asked all of these couples, I was like, so who wears your pants? And it turned into this like family joke. And then now it was this thing where they'd always, we'd all like, whenever we reach out to each other, we're like, so who's wearing your pants today? And then, but really it's, it's a, yeah, but, um, now, and now it's the podcast. But I think that for me now I've inferred that that statement is like, who is owning your life? Ooh, I like that. And I would say me. There you go. That's like mm-hmm. the answer that we're usually hoping for, but sometimes it's not. Yeah. I would be curious <laughs> of what other people answer to that Oh, question. usually it's like a joke. Um, the last guest said his dog. Oh, uh, do you know what? I literally was about to be like, is he going to say his dog? Yeah. yeah. I would let my dog wear my pants, but I don't think he wants to. So. I did, oh, you have a dog? And it's my dad's dog, but I like okay. grew up with him. His name's okay, Rooney. Okay. Shout out to Rooney. You're probably not listening to this, but. You never know. He yeah. could be. <laughs> in the background (laughs) maybe he is um well thank you so much for being here and if people want to find you follow you stalk you call you yes connect love some you know blocked 619 calls perfect um yeah jake heilbrunn is my name it's h-e-i-l-b-r-u-n-n so if you put that um instagram or the podcast curious with jake heilbrunn which is wherever podcasts play that's probably the best place to connect and yeah, thank you for having me. You're such a good host. You ask like insightful questions and you're like present and you like go where the conversation is flowing, I which am. I think is like a beautiful art that I always try and improve and learn. So it's really, really fun to talk. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. <laughs>
Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Who Wears Your Pants. Please do me a favor and hit subscribe. Leave me a review or a comment so that I can turn this disaster of a show into something great. I need you. No, seriously, I do. And if you're feeling really invigorated, check out my corner of the interwebs at kirstentrammell.com or let's get really social on the gram at kirsten underscore underscore trammel because as a ginger, I need all the friends I can get. Peace and love, my homies. I will see you next time.